I'm officially changing my title. I really like that one a lot better than mine. <laughs> so experience is the best teacher. I think we've heard a lot today about how unpleasant experiences are particularly good teachers. I think every person in here remembers a time where you touched something that was searingly hot and jerked your hand back even before the sensation properly registered as pain. And we all know that these kinds of experiences are way more effective than a thousand warnings from someone telling you, be careful, don't touch that, that's hot. Touching something hot and having that experience causes you to be way more careful around that specific hot thing and to be aware of and wary around hot things in general. It might even make you try really hard to keep other people from burning themselves by, say, turning pot handles inwards on the stove all the time. I think that failures are very much like those kinds of experiences. They are shocking, they are painful, but they're educational and focusing and motivating. And in my opinion, to get the best out of these unpleasant, unfortunate events that happen to us, we need to do two things. Number one, really squeeze every drop of wisdom we can out of these things that happen to us so we can use those lessons going forward. And number two, try to cultivate a mindset that makes us able to take in the lessons that other people learn through their failures, misfortunes, and, un and unplanned events, and use those things to change our behavior, to actually change our thinking so that we don't have to learn everything the hard way ourselves. So growing up, I was really interested in learning about all things related to space. I watched a lot of Star Trek and Star Wars and Battlestar Galactica with my mom and my brothers. And on those shows, there were often episodes with dramatic plot lines where there was damage to the ship because of fighting or alien force fields or whatever. And the crew had to use their ingenuity in order to solve those things. Sometimes the engineer got to swoop in and save the day, even though sometimes it took them maybe two or three times to come up with an engineer with an idea that actually worked. And in the real world, I watched several documentaries growing up about the dawn of the space age, when a lot of them included montages with rocket after rocket exploding and veering off course and falling to the ground. And even though those experiences were really painful for everybody involved, at the very least, it meant weeks or months, if not years of work going up in smoke. Every time they encountered a failure, they learned something that they could use to adjust what they were doing and incorporate that into their design and try again and try again and try again until eventually they started having successes. Early on in school, I graduated from high school. I went to the University of Kentucky to study mechanical engineering, which I hoped was gonna be the first step on a path to having a career in the aerospace industry. I was very fortunate to land a full scholarship that required me to keep a 3.3 GPA. Now, I was a pretty good student in high school. I did work really hard, but a lot of things came easily to me, so I think that made me a little bit complacent in my freshman semester. At the University of Kentucky, they had this great program where they wanted to take incoming scholarship students and kind of give us a scared straight approach to make sure that we didn't veer off track from being all on our own for the first time and partying too hard or whatever. So they actually had a student from the previous year that had slipped below the 3.3 average and was on probation and just had one semester to pull his grades up, come and talk to us. And it turns out that I knew this guy. He had gone to high school with me and I had wondered, like you do about the graduating seniors, what had happened to him and everybody else. Well, he came and told us a story of how he partied too hard, he wasn't paying enough attention in classes, his grades fell, and now he was in this horrifying position where he had to work extra hard to drag his GPA up and not lose his scholarship. And I, I knew what was going on here, right? They wanted to bring kids who were just like us to give us a story and then everything would be good for all the rest of us. Made perfect sense, it resonated with me, I listened to his story. But I think my overwhelming reaction was, yeah, but I'm a great student, this is not gonna be me, right? <laughs> Enter Chemistry One. Now, all of us incoming uh, freshmen knew that Chemistry One was considered to be a difficult weed out class. It was taught in a large lecture hall, just like this one, and it was just really hard. Now, me and chemistry had never really been friends in high school, <laughs> and instead of heeding the warning of knowing this was a weed out class, hearing the warning from the student that talked to us, 
I sat in the back of the class, like right about there. I talked to my friend, I did the crossword puzzle, I didn't go to class all the time, and, and as you can imagine, I wasn't doing great. I could tell with the quizzes on the way through that all was not going well. However, I assumed that there was gonna be a curve, you know, everybody's having a hard time in this class, it probably won't be too bad, somehow magically everything was just gonna work out okay. Well, at the end of the semester, when they were mailing grades home, I was out of town. And so my mom called me to tell me the news. And I can still hear her opening the envelope on the other side of the phone. I can hear the silence as I imagine her scanning over the document. And she says to me in very serious tones, OK, Tracy, there's good news and there's bad news. What do you want first? And I'm like, well, tell me the bad news. We'll save the good news for later. OK, bad news first, bad news first. And she said, you know the class you were worried you were going to get a C in? Well, you got a D. Wow. And I just had this moment of sheer panic when I realized that I was that guy. I was turning into that cautionary tale who'd be like talking to the students the next time coming in and yeah, don't do what I did, right? It's horrifying. But after a moment, she said, the good news is you got an A and everything else. So you just barely squeaked in with a 3.328. <sighs> and I felt just like I had snatched my hand back from a hot stove fast enough to get a blister without doing myself more damage. Holy cow. So that near failure really motivated me to change my chemistry study habits, right? So I retook chemistry one the next year. I didn't fail, but come on, I couldn't keep that on my transcript. I retook chemistry one the next semester, as well as chemistry two, so I could stay on schedule. And I did what you know you're supposed to do. I sat in the front of the class, and I showed up to every class, and I took notes, and I read the material beforehand. I went to office. I was the model student in chemistry <laughs> that time. And all of that extra work paid off. I got an A in chemistry one and two, yay me. And I also realized this really great silver lining associated with this failure. It turns out at that time, I don't know if they still do this, but the University of Kentucky allowed students to retake up to three classes and they didn't just average the grades together, they threw out the first grade and replaced it with the second grade. So if you were to look back at my transcripts now, it looked like I got a 4.0 in my freshman year. Like I was just hot stuff the whole time through. <laughs> but this whole experience really let me see that I wasted a lot of time. I could have taken in the lesson that was taught by that student, paid attention in class, and not had to go through the horror of doing it the hard way. So after graduating from the University of Kentucky, I did much better for the rest of my time there, in case you were wondering. I went to Georgia Tech to get my master's degree in mechanical engineering, and I went on to land a job working for NASA at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory here in Pasadena, California. And I was embedded early on as a systems engineer working on the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter Project. Now, if you're not familiar with that role, a systems engineer's job is to work very closely with people who are specialists in a variety of areas around a spacecraft or a project like propulsion and thermal and flight software or ground data systems and navigation, all of that jazz, and ensure that all of those things were being designed in a way that they were going to come together smoothly and work in order to accomplish the overall mission goals. So as a brand new engineer, every person I talked to knew a ton more than I did. So it was hard not to feel a little bit useless some of the time, most of the time, all, kind of all the time <laughs> when I first started working. And the thing that was great is I realized that at the lab, the more senior engineers actually appreciated when junior engineers asked questions about something that would drive a deeper discussion about the work that we were doing. Uh, those of you who are students, if you can imagine or remember a time when you were tutoring another student in a subject that you were more comfortable in than they were. They might ask you a question and you would know the answer, but maybe you'd go off and do a little bit of digging and come back with a more complete answer. And that way you both wind up with a more nuanced understanding of why the answer was what it was. So you're bringing value to the student, but they're also bringing value to you and helping you hone your understanding in something. So similarly, in the work that we do, when an engineer, any engineer, even a junior one, asks a question about something or why we're doing something the way we are, it can cause the more experienced experts to reassess 
what we're doing and maybe ultimately change something. When you're trying to develop complicated spacecraft and instruments and send them out to explore new planets, we're really stretching the bounds of technology and applying techniques to brand new and different mission designs. So questioning given assumptions about how we're doing things is a great way to ensure we're incorporating changes appropriately along the way and not just stagnating in our methods. I also learned a lot about the NASA Lessons Learned database, which is a way that we try to make sure we share the lessons that are learned by engineers. So you don't just learn from the issues and problems you bump into along the way. That would be expensive, reinventing the wheel in space every time. Wow. So we like to gather the knowledge from people working on a variety of different missions and keep them in a place where we can get to them. Actually, you, any member of the public, can go to this website right there and look at the contents of the, of the Lessons Learned database. And it includes a broad array of issues that, were, that cropped up along many, many years. And the engineers have described what happened and how they resolved the issue, and also generalized lessons that can be extracted from that and applied to more missions going forward. It is a really big solar system out there. <laughs> when we send spacecraft like the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter to Mars or Juno to Jupiter, we're sending them tremendously far away. For example, the Earth is 93 million miles away from the sun. And that is a big dif a distance. When we say things like million this, billion that, your brain doesn't really do anything with that number. But if you were to drive a 93 million mile line at 100 miles an hour, it would take you 106 years to reach the end. Mach 1 here on the Earth at sea level is 760 miles an hour. That would still take you nearly 14 years to reach the end. Now, we communicate with our spacecraft using electromagnetic waves that travel at the speed of light. Light zips along at 670 million miles per hour. Now we're talking. But it still takes an appreciable 8 minutes and 19 seconds for light to travel 93 million miles. Now, when we're communicating with our spacecraft from the Earth, sometimes the Earth is on the other side of the sun from Mars and Jupiter. Mars is farther away from the sun than the Earth is. Jupiter is farther still. When, they're on, when the Earth is over here and these planets are on this side, the longest one-way light time distance to Mars can be as much as 24 minutes. And the longest one-way light time all the way out to Jupiter can be as much as 50 minutes, over 50 minutes. And so we really cannot just joystick those spacecraft while they're out there. We have to make sure they can take care of themselves in, in, in time-sensitive situations where we can't just send them commands and tell them what to do. So we spend a tremendous amount of time trying to go through all of the f horrible scenarios we can come up with for things that could go wrong and anticipating them. For example, this is one of the kinds of tools that we use. This is called a, well, this isn't it. I'll show you in a second. <laughs> it's called a mission fault tree, where we try to take a very critical event in the mission, like launch, for example. If launch does not go right, it is game over for everyone. And we take launch and we say, well, let's break that down into all the major things that could go wrong to make launch not be successful. For example, maybe your spacecraft is not producing power or it's losing power or something in a temperature sense, a component is getting way too hot or getting way too cold. Maybe you don't have a communications link with the spacecraft. Maybe you're not even on the right trajectory, and so on and so on. We think of all those big major things that could go wrong. And then we'll take each one and expand it out. Well, why aren't you producing power? Well, maybe my solar arrays did not deploy when they were stowed up on the launch vehicle. Maybe they're deployed, but they're not producing power, and so on and so forth. And then you take each one of those, like say, well, why didn't your solar arrays deploy? Well, maybe the latches that hold it shut when you're on the launch vehicle just didn't release. Well, maybe that released, but then you had a hinge that seized up. Well, maybe the hinge was doing just fine, but you had a damper that froze. And maybe the damper was fine, but yeah, and so on and so on. You get the idea. Lots and lots of things. And we keep going and do that for every branch and sub-branch and sub-branch and so on and so on. Hundreds of items for each of these major events that you might want to choose. And when we get down to the things that are like the leaves on the end, for each one of those, we say, well, how do we either prevent that thing from happening, like say in our latch valve, or not on our damper issue, um, we're never gonna let anything get anywhere near cold enough for a damper to freeze, okay? And 
that or you make the spacecraft be capable of dealing with it even if it does happen. Like in the latch valve, in the latch example, maybe you have two pyro valves that will fire and only one of them needs to fire for the whole thing to let go. And then for each one of those things, we figure out a way to prove to ourselves that that either robustness or prevention is going to work by doing some analysis or some test or some inspection and so on and so on. This is an incredible amount of work, but it's important because once our space draft is hundreds of millions of miles from us, we can't go whack it with a wrench and make something work. So we have to do all of this stuff up front. This is just one of the many ways we try to go about problem proofing our spacecraft. But we know from decades of experience that no matter how much analysis you do, no matter how much design tweaking you do, chances are good just because of the sheer novelty of what we're doing that everything is not going to go exactly according to plan. But the idea is if we spend this much time beating down all the issues we can possibly think of, the ones that slip through are hopefully ones that we can just deal with in flight. So this is going to be an example from my recent experience on the Juno mission. Now, Juno launched in 2011 on its way to Jupiter, and it took a big looping path way out beyond the orbit of Mars, looping back in by the Earth in 2013 in order to get a gravity assist. We needed the Earth flyby in order to increase the acceleration of the spacecraft enough to get all the way out to Jupiter three years later in July 2016. Now, the Earth flyby event is not critical in the same way that launch is because we did all of the final trajectory correction maneuvers weeks and months in advance to set the spacecraft up on its path to do the flyby. So at that point, it was really all just physics. Now, we were doing some things with the spacecraft, like turning instruments on and allowing them an opportunity to take data from the Earth as a practice run for when we finally got all the way out to Jupiter. Uh, so we were, we were interested in the spacecraft still doing stuff. And on the day of Earth flyby, we knew that the spacecraft was gonna go on a path that took it behind the Earth with respect to the sun, where we're going into the Earth's shadow. And we knew that, we planned for it, we designed for it. We did analysis to make sure nothing on the spacecraft was gonna get too cold when it's here in the shadow. We made sure we had enough energy in the battery because the spacecraft would be just relying on its battery. There'd be no sun on their rays to produce power. I also knew that Juno was based largely on Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter heritage. On that spacecraft at Mars, it goes into the Mars shadow with respect to the sun every couple of hours, every orbit, and the hardware has always worked just fine. On Juno, this was gonna be our only time passing into the shadow of a planet after launch. We designed the orbit so that when we got all the way out of Jupiter, if you guys are the sun, the spacecraft is orbiting this way, so it would always have sun on the arrays. One of the things we do at the lab in order to make sure we spread the knowledge around of things that people have learned on other projects is have engineers on a mission present our plans for major events like this to very senior engineers and managers at the lab in order to ask them for their advice and suggestions on other things we should do or think about before we actually go do this event. So we presented, presented all our plans and all our details. People gave us plenty of suggestions, things to go look at. But one of them also reiterated the fact that this is a unique event in your mission. You need to really be careful about it. Look at everything with, with critical eyes, double check, triple check. We totally agreed. We had already done that, but we went back and did it again. We looked at our analysis some more. We did a couple of additional cases. Everything looked fine. And in my mind, the hardware was designed to do this. The analysis was showing that it was fine. Everything was checking out. We were gonna be testing the sequences. So we were good to go. On the day of Earth flyby, we had our whole operations team and our two mission support areas. It was a very exciting day. It's always exciting when big things are happening. And we even had this really cool outreach event going on where ham radio operators all across the world were sending a synchronized high signal to the spacecraft that we would be able to pick up with one of our instruments and then tell the world later, we heard you when we were going by, super cute, right? <laughs> so it, it was really exciting. The whole world was watching and, and we were all in this together, waiting for the spacecraft to go by on its last class closed past the Earth before it headed out on its way all the way out to Jupiter. Um, and so on that day, we all have our eyes glued to the telemetry. Everything is going picture perfect, tick, 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 all the way through. We were getting near the point where we were gonna go across the day-night terminator and the spacecraft was heading into the darkness. And 
Everything was still going fine, tick, tick, tick. It went picture perfect until it got about 12 minutes into the 19 minute eclipse. And then the spacecraft was monitoring its internal power state. It hit a limit that we told it to respond to and turned all the instruments off and turned its antenna back to earth and sent the message that something was wrong with it. My thought was, you have got to be kidding. We looked at this so many times. How did we miss it? How did I miss this? Now, the first thing you're concerned about when something like this is happening is, is the spacecraft healthy and safe? And happily, we could see in the telemetry that it was. But we needed to wait until we got all the data down so we can figure out exactly what had happened. And it was a long and complicated story, but it boils down to a few things. Number one, there was a little bit of a design change between MRO and Juno in the power system, which wasn't being quite reflected in the traditional way we were still doing the power analysis on the ground. And there was a little um, conflation between how we chose the initial starting battery charge level and the level that we had programmed it to respond. Spacecraft are only going to do what you tell them to do, right? So this whole thing kicked off a long investigation for us and, and an improvement of our power analysis process. And the silver lining of that is we spent a lot more time and effort on that than we might have if Earth flyby had gone completely fine. And if we had decided much later in the game to do a major upgrade to our power analysis process, we would have been trying to do that piled on top of all the other work we were doing to get ready for our arrival at Jupiter and all the other stuff we've been learning since we got in orbit. So that wound up being a great silver lining. And a big takeaway for me was it's really hard to spot tiny nuanced problems if in the back of your mind subconsciously you really think there's nothing wrong. But if you can switch your perspective, convince yourself there is a problem and you have to find it, then you can bring that laser focus to what you're doing. Now the problem is you can't spend 10,000 hours on 10,000 tiny little insignificant issues, most of which are unlikely. But you have to find the way to focus in on the ones that matter and thinking about new different unique events is usually a pretty good place to start. So for me, I've been working at the lab for 17 years. I've had the fortune of working on three different flight missions, Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, Kepler, and Juno. And what I've learned is that it's those issues you bump into along the way that teach you the best lesson. These are the ways that we, as engineers, grow into more experienced veterans and are more able to recognize and predict potential issues in the future. The last thing I wanted to leave you with is this. A lot of people think that the path to success means you make the wrong turn and you wind up at failure, or you make the right turn and you wind up at success. But in my experience, and I think we've heard a lot here today, the right path to success typically leads right through failure uh, as evidenced by this. Failure leads you to learn a lot of things that help get you over the obstacles in your way towards success. So the next time you have an unpleasant, unfortunate event happen to you, please resist the urge to put it behind you, close your eyes to it, and never speak of it again. That would be such a waste. It's already happened, so you might as well pull it in close and peel away all the layers and get every last ounce of knowledge you can get out of it, because those are the things that are going to help you on your path to success. Thank you.